Hello, this is uh, Dimitrios Vavas. I'm going to be talking about epiretinal membranes. There are many synonyms for this condition, like epimacular membrane, macular packer, cellophane maculopathy, preretinal macular fibrosis. The most common name is epiretinal membrane and macular packer. It is an avascular fibrocellular tissue on the inner retinal surface resulting from cellular proliferation and metaplasia. It is most frequently seen in patients over the age of 50 and can be seen in about 3 to 15 percent of them. Asymptomatic prevalence may be much higher, even as high as 25 percent, especially in the elderly. There is no clear gender predilection and 20 to 30 percent of them may be bilateral. Posterior vitreous detachment is seen in about 80 to 90 percent of them and is thought that it is pathogenic. Other causes are trauma tears, retinal detachment, laser cryo, infection, inflammation, uveitis, retinal vascular disorders like retinal venoclusions and diabetic retinopathy. Cataract surgery is also thought to incite it and can be seen in up to 10% post-cataract surgery. Some of these cases may be pre-existing. Much less common is also seen in some tumors. The original idea of the pathogenesis was that the PVD induces defects in the ILM that allow mural glial cells to migrate and form the epiretinal membrane. Other hypotheses implicate vitreomacular attraction and anomalous vitreous schisis and the hyalocytes, the cells of the cortical vitreous, proliferating and differentiating to myofibroblasts leading to ERM formation. In secondary causes, inflammatory cells and retinal pigment epithelium are thought to be key players, as well as inflammatory cytokines, the leukin 6, 8, and monocyte chemotactin protein 1. As we said, there are several different cells that have been identified in epiretinal membranes, glial cells, Mueller and exocytes, hyalocytes from the cortical vitreous remnants, RPE cells, and myofibroblasts. Because of Transdifferentiation of one cell to other cell types, the exact origin of a lot of these cells is contested, and the presence of RPE cells may be only seen when the ERM is secondary to retinal breaks and retinal detachment. Epiretinal membranes can lead to leakage on fluorescent and geography, and the epiretinal membrane can be the sole cause of vascular leakage. Clinical findings of this condition include uh, reflective scene, stria of the inner retina, ectopia of the fovea, vessel tortuosity, systoid macular edema and, and geographic leakage. Occasionally, petechial hemorrhages can be seen, as well as RPE changes from the presence of fluid from macular edema most often. The presenting visual acuity when it is symptomatic is usually 2030 to 2070. Most are better than 2050 and up to 5% of them can be worse than 2200. They also complain even with good vision of distortion and metamorphopsia. Sometimes, rarely, they can even have monocular diplopia. The epiretinal membrane and the symptoms progress in the minority of the patients, 10 to 30%. There is a range of presentation and mismatch of visual acuity and anatomy, and we're going to see here a patient that has significant RM by 20-25 visual acuity. Here is 2200 with vascular leakage. This patient 2060, patient with 2025, 2030, another patient with 2050, 2030, and a patient with a visual acuity of 2070. Here we see a patient that has actually counting fingers uh, with significant uh, fibrosis of the epiretinal membrane after retinal detachment. And uh, we see after membrane peel, there's restoration, but not perfect anatomy, but the postal vision went from counting fingers to 2070. The the, there is um, only surgery as a real solution to this problem, and the indication for surgery is progressive vision loss, symptomatic with functional issues. Typically, this is when the visual acuity is less than 2040, but we can operate in patients with better vision if symptoms affect their activities. There are different ways to uh, peel the membrane by using flex loop and, and gently scraping or using forceps and uh, mechanically peeling. Uh, but uh, 
the goal is to, as traumatic as possible, remove the epithelial tissue. Here is a clinical case of a 67-year-old man with distortion and 27 visual acuity who uh, underwent uh, a retinal membrane peel and one day post-op we see the fundus improvement, dramatic, and we see the same thing in, um, in the OCT and dramatic improvement in the anatomy of the tissue. If we, um, but not perfection. If we look in tabular form, what happens to the vision, we see by the third month there is improvement to 2020, even though the anatomy has not been perfectly restored. Of course, we care mostly about the function and not about the anatomy so much. If we look at the time course of the surgical improvement, we find out that there is a nice exponential curve and uh, the on average, the visual acuity uh, improves from a um, 0.5 preoperatively to 0.4 logmar at one at the first week, 0.33 at the first month, 0.26 at three months, and 0.22 at 12 months. It can continue to improve even up to two years later. We will see that the OCT matches that. 24% of uh, what we will see finally is uh, gained in the first day. Half of the final gain is realized by the first week, 88% is realized by three months, and 95% by 12 months. So what we said to the patients is that they expect to see improvement week by week, and the majority of the improvement will happen by th the third month, and then some small improvement, 10% remaining over the next year to two. Here is another patient that even four years later we can see improvement from 2080 to 2020 visual acuity. The metamorphopsia does not improve as drastically and as, as much. 50% of the gain of the metamorphopsia is uh, realized by three months and 70% of the gains are realized by one year, but there's still a 30% of the preoperative level of distortion remaining even at one year. The general um, uh, statistics for who is going to improve is about 8 out of 10 patients are going to see more than two lines of improvement and 2 out of 10 patients will see a mild improvement. Almost all will have some residual deficit and metamorphopsia. Asymptomatic recurrence is seen in 10 to 20 percent. Symptomatic recurrence is only about 1 to 1.5 one percent. And this brings me to the discussion about the role of ILM peeling. Do we need to peel the normal structure that all of us has and bothers none of us? ILM. When we peel the ILM, we have dissociated outer nerve fiber layer and microscotomas. And although it does reduce the recurrence from 1.5% to about 1%, the number needed to treat to avoid one recurrence is 200. Way too much and not worth given the associated iatrogenic risks of microscotomas and less optimal visual function. The surgery has risks as any surgery. Cataracts, uh, almost all patients would develop a cataract if they are fetic. This will happen within the next two to five years. Some of them may even within months. Tears and retinal attachments are rare, about 22%, and with a modern 25 and 27 gauge vitrectomy and good peripheral inspection and wide field viewing, it's even less than that. Recurrences, as we said, most of them are asymptomatic, 1.5% about. How to proceed if you have a peritoneal membrane cataract? Cataract surgery first is my preference in some Patients may be happy enough after the cataract surgery and avoid the vitrectomy and membrane peel. A recent study from Taiwan favors a peritoneal membrane peeling first because they claim that in their data they see better final visual acuity if membrane is peeled before the cataract surgery is done. Of course, one can consider combined surgery, FECO and uh, membrane peel. Personally, is my last preference because they're slightly more inflammatory process and slightly more CME. 
Many doctors and patients will prefer it because of only one trip to the OR and faster rehabilitation. I would like also to talk about a subset of epiretinal membrane, a peculiar type of it called epiretinal proliferation, which is usually seen with lamellar holes and thought not to have much traction. It is a thick uh, membrane with moderate reflectivity by optical coherence tomography, whereas idiopathic ERMs are shown as thin and highly reflective. The peeling may not result in as good outcome as regular epiretinal membrane, and more people may lose visual acuity and holes may form in about 15% of the cases after surgical peel. A study uh, in Boston by a Duker group so that despite anatomical improvement, there was not functional improvement in these cases. However, others since that study have tried to do a modified peel of the membrane, sparing the fovea and even stuffing the stuff in the lamellar hole. And in this case, some patients may gain vision. If the epiretinal proliferation is associated with full thickness macular hole, surgery in these situations leads to less closure rate and less improvement in vision. How about natural history and resolution? Can the ERM resolve or the problem resolve spontaneously? And the answer is yes, and it is about 1%, like this case of mine. So in summary, epiretinal membrane is primary idiopathic, is the most common. Most of them are mild and non-progressive. There is variable presentation and there can be a mismatch between the anatomy and the vision. We do do surgery for symptomatic cases. 80% of the patients will improve substantially and be happy, but residual deficits always are present. Difficult to predict who is going to be in the 80% or in the 20% group. Internal limiting membrane peel leads to mild detriment in vision and minimal rest recurrence and should be avoided. Side effects, almost always you will have cataract, and symptomatic recurrences are rare, about 1 to 1.5%. Thank you very much for your attention.